What's going on guys? So we are in it with another Q&A. The last time I posted on Instagram for you guys to uh, throw me some questions, you threw me like 40. So in the last Q&A, just for the sake of keeping it, you know, to a 15 or 20 minute video, I only got, I was only able to answer like eight or 10 questions. And there was actually a bunch of really good questions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna refer back to that post and I'm gonna try and get to another eight or 10. And uh, let's see what we got here. Let's just jump right in. So here we go. Um, Pablito OR. He said, what can you do to prevent or help out hip pain when squatting? Um, this is a good one. This is actually a question that uh, I should be able to answer and help out a little bit because I do suffer um, with a lot of hip issues myself. This right hip, which I believe, well, self-diagnose. I'm not a doctor or physical therapist by any means, so take it for what it is. Just a power lifter over here. But basically, this right hip, um, or glute med. So obviously you have three muscles in the glute, the minimus, medius, and maximus. So the medius seems to be the one uh, that gives a lot of power lifters trouble. Typically, uh, just because of the frequency in which we're squatting and we're squatting heavy loads. So not to say it's inevitable, but if you don't take the right precaution, it's almost bound to happen. Um, once it so let's just say you're already suffering from the hip pain. My number one recommendation would be more warming up. So what I like to do is obviously some type of um, dynamic warm ups, which include, um, you know, I like to throw in some hip circle just to get things moving. But then I go into like a barbell complex, which consists of like RDLs, squats. I even throw in like overhead press and rows just to get my whole body moving, get the blood flowing. So that's not really directly for the hip, but just overall body functionality. And then what I'll do before squats, specifically for my hip, is with my warm-ups, I do pause reps. So sitting down into the hole, really getting a good stretch in the hips, um, making sure my range of motion is, uh, isn't limited at all because of the glue or whatever the issue may be. And then uh, I like to do some you know, front front to back leg swings, anterior, posterior, and then also lateral. So, you know, hold on to the squat rack, kick, kick front and back, kick side to side. I do that, that really helps loosen up the hips. Um, sometimes I'll even sit in a, uh, kind of like a sumo squat position and just kind of, um, after I'm warmed up a little bit, because this is a little more static, but you know, I'll sit in a sumo squat position and kind of force my knees out just to uh, feel what it's gonna be like when you're in the bottom of the hole for a squat. So that's just, what I'm getting at is just warming up better as a whole. What I just said, might you, know, you might not like that. Maybe you do something different. And then also in prevention is stretching after your squat day. So, um, you know, what happens is, is you're working the muscle. The, mu the muscle is, you know, loosening up during training, but then it's gonna start tightening up after training. If you're not stretching that muscle, um, it's gonna get even tighter, uh, to put it as basic as possible. So make sure you're warming up properly and then make sure your post-workout, your cool down stretching is also there. Do that consistent, consistently and you'll notice that your body feels much better. It's yeah, crazy, right? Crazy concept, but uh, a lot of us neglect those areas, so that's where a lot of those nagging uh, injuries or um, tweaks happen. Uh, another thing is just maybe you back down the frequency in which you're squatting. So another simple solution is, most likely it's because of overuse. I would bring in those other aspects that we just talked about as well, but overuse. Very common with powerlifting, you're doing those same three movements so much uh, without proper you know, injury prevention, like uh, stretching, mobility, stuff like that, they're gonna happen, it's inevitable. So if you're pushing yourself, things are gonna happen, but knowing when to pull back is another um, 
Very simple, I know this isn't like rocket science or any, any groundbreaking information, but just pull back your frequency or volume a little bit. Hopefully that answered that. I think I always start off these Q and A's like rambling way too much with the first question. Alrighty, what do we got here? I, uh, here's one from Ray Duvall, it's actually one of my clients. He actually, <coughs> excuse me, he said, what do you do for stretching and mobility before your big three? So I kind of hit on that with the first question. I do the same warm up essentially every training day. It consists of like a barbell complex and then um, after that the more dynamic movements will be specific to that movement, like whether it's squat bench or deadlift for that day. Squat and uh, deadlift kind of similar for the most part, but sometimes, depending on how your body's feeling, you know, you might need to change things up a little bit. So <clears throat> here we go. Uh, what, this is from I am Juvit. What do you think about Smolov Junior Squat Program? Um, so actually, one of the first programs that I actually ran, because I started out like a lot of people, I went online, looked for a program, I heard about Smolov, I think via Instagram, and I ran it. And uh, honestly, I think maybe because of the way I'm built, I'm 6'1", longer limbs, I'm not the prototypical power lifter as far as build, especially for squatting. Most people think of their training week Monday through Sunday or Sunday through Saturday, seven days. What I had to do for this program was basically make a, an eight or 10 day training week. So I would follow the program as is, but what I would do is, um, you know, so the first squat day would be actually like day one. Then maybe I would do the second squat day on day three. Then the third squat day would be on like day six or seven. And then the last squat day, because I think it's four days a week, would be on like days eight, nine, or 10, depending on what I needed as far as recovery. Because again, I'm not really built optimally to squat that much. So frequency for me has to be managed um, throughout the programming. Sometimes um, I have to back it down to squatting only twice a week but I have already pushed four times a week. I have already, I, most of the time I'm pushing it three times a week, but sometimes three times a week, it, it catches up with me and I know I have to pull back. And uh, once you kind of learn those uh, indicators when you should pull back and you, and you can actually check your ego and pull back, you're gonna be so much better off, trust me. Here we go, DJ Wombat Eloper. Interesting name, bro. What's the best squat accessory exercise to build mobility while also maintaining strength in a deload cycle? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, what what I would say is a lot, a lot of squat questions. Everyone wants a big squat now. Did you notice the transition of like five years ago is only how much you bench? Now it's like squat. Everyone wants to squat more. I kind of like it. I would say the best accessory exercise to build mobility would be uh, maybe a front squat, just because, and maybe like a paused front squat, because, because uh, why do I keep saying because? I don't know, but anyway. With the bar being on uh, the front delts rather than your back, you're able to maintain a more vertical back position. Uh, so what that's gonna also allow you to do is sit down into the hole a little bit deeper. Um, I would recommend using light to moderate weight. It's a front squat, it's a variation, especially if you're adding in a pause on top of it. You don't need to be going super heavy. Control the weight, focus on maintaining tension while you're in the hole pausing. And uh, that'll, because you're able to go a little bit lower, you're increasing your range of motion, that's gonna uh, help your mobility once you go back to your back squat. Here's one from Pierre Stay Sick. Can you tell us your program for the arms? All right, so my program for arms. Now, there is no program. Um, I add in triceps pretty, uh, pretty often. Obviously with doing bench, you're getting a lot of tricep activation, but then after that, I like to add in a few tricep accessories. Biceps, 
I might do four bicep exercises a week if I'm lucky. And it might just be like one added in at the end of each training session. So I don't really hit arms as hard as I used to. But back in the day when I was doing way more bodybuilder things, I used to fucking crush arms. Uh, twice a week, like full arm days for like an hour, hour and a half, which probably was too much. But then again, I did build up decent sized arms, especially because I have longer arms. Look at how long this is. Condor, condor-like wingspan, but pretty decent size arm. So I would put it on the uh, amount of amount of arm days that I used to do, and uh, sometimes I even add a third day. Uh, what I'm actually going to do, and I've been working on it now for a little while, is I'm putting together an arm day or an arm program. So basically, the goal is to just get bigger arms, and it's going to be based on what I used to do five, six years ago, where my arms went from like noodle arms to 18 and a half inches at one point. I think they're actually down a little bit. They might still be 18, but at one point they were 18 and a half inches. So I'm gonna make that program. It's gonna be like four weeks long, something that you can do and then repeat, and then also maybe add a few things of your own. So it should be pretty cool. Keep an eye out for that. Let's do a couple more here. We're at 11 minutes, almost 12 minutes already. What's your opinion on how to best cut fat without losing strength and having minimal loss on gains? So that's a good one. The age old question, how do I get more jacked basically and still maintain strength or get stronger? So my advice to you there is, nutrition is gonna have to play a bigger role. Depending on what you're eating and when you're eating might depict your body composition um, and your performance in the gym, aka maintaining that strength or getting stronger. So what I would probably recommend for you is, now this is just based on like my experience. I, again, I'm not an, a nutrition expert by any means. Um, but just from my personal experience, what I have always had success with is using a flexible diet. So tracking my macros and calories. For me, I've always been lucky enough to really focus on just calories, whether that was in like a minor deficit or a surplus. Most of the time I've always been in a surplus. My goal is to always get bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger. I'm not ever really looking to cut, but unless it's for a meet. So sometimes before a meet, I might have to cut a few pounds. But anyway, before I get off track, what I would recommend maybe is to try some intermittent fasting. This is something I've done, but almost unintentionally. So I'm just never very hungry in the morning, so I've never eaten much in the morning. I usually have my first meal around noon. And then from what the research I've done is, is it says that intermittent fasting will help kind of burn more fat. After the fact, after me reading this, doing a little research, I'm like, wow, I've kind of been doing this unintentionally for all this time, and I've always maintained a, leader, a leaner body composition. So that kind of makes sense. And then, but the base of everything for me, nutrition-wise, is always just flexible dieting. So if uh, I look at my cal or my total calories, and I look at my, my carbs, my fats, and my protein. For me, I know I respond better to lower carbs, higher fat, and protein. So protein, most of the time, I'm just gonna tell you one gram per pound of body weight. It's kind of like the standard, I would say. And it seems to have worked for years and years and years. It's always worked for me. That's always kind of been my goal. So if I can go a little higher, I do. But I've always responded better to higher fat um, rather than like boosting my carbs up in order to get more calories. So I've always responded better lower carbs um, now, this is where it kind of gets a little tricky is training day to non-training day. On a training day, I'd recommend that you do spike your carbs up a little bit, obviously for performance reasons. You wanna be able to go into the gym, uh, maximize your training that day, feel strong, move as much weight as you can, handle the workload. Um, and on non-training days, you don't need those carbs. There's not gonna be that caloric expenditure um, to utilize those carbs efficiently. 
So what you'll have there is possibly, uh, you know, that's where body composition will kind of get away from you and uh, you'll, you won't be able to maintain as lean a body composition as you, as you would like. So the carbs are the one that I really play with. Um, fats and protein for me stay roughly the same. Training days, carbs will get a, a spike and then on the, the non-training days, carbs will come, they'll come down quite a bit. Now that's gonna vary uh, for you guys all individually, but that's where I'd recommend you starting. I don't do any paleo or keto or uh, any of that stuff. The intermittent fasting thing, like I said, the only reason I even brought that up is because I've kind of done that unintentionally, but it has, it seems like it played a role in why I've always maintained a leaner body composition. So that might be something you wanna play with and then also the flexible dieting. So figure out your macros, figure out your calories that you wanna hit each day depending on your goal and then track, be consistent. Again, it always comes out of consistency, right? Like how boring of an answer is that? But it's just the truth. That's with anything, training, nutrition, work, everything. So again, got a, got a little bit of a ramble there. I don't know, sometimes, sometimes I just get lost, you know? I don't even know what I'm saying now. Corey, edit this out. Edit this shit out of me. Jesus Christ. I don't even know what I'm saying. We're at 16 minutes. I'm gonna wrap this up here. One more question. This one's from Nicole Rissacrum. I don't know how to say your name, but Nicole, your her question was, what's your favorite, high or low bar? For me, low bar. Because I compete in powerlifting, low bar allows me to move the most weight possible. So low bar is gonna be my favorite. That doesn't mean everyone needs to do low bar. Um, I do implement a lot of high bar because it takes a lot of the stress off my upper body joints such as my wrists, my elbows, my shoulders. When I'm in the low bar position, uh, there's a lot of tension throughout. So. I can only usually handle one or two low bar days a week, and I've been squatting three times a week, so typically that third day is maybe a high bar uh, squat day, which allows me to squat and get more volume in, but much easier on my body. So I'm gonna wrap things up there, guys. I hope you like the Q&As. I hope they're informative. Uh, try, try to keep things basic for you. Um, try to hit the questions that I feel can help a majority of you. I'll probably post something on Instagram to get more questions in the future. I'd like to keep doing the Q&As maybe bi-weekly. Uh, got a good response from the last one. So let me know what you think of the Q&As. Comment below. Give me, a, uh, give, me, give me some type of feedback. Like the video if you liked it. Subscribe if you haven't. I hope you notice I'm picking up the consistency game on the YouTube. So make sure you're following along, make sure you subscribe. I think there's like a notifications button. Maybe you hit that if you don't wanna miss any. I appreciate you guys, always, always appreciate the support. I will see you in the next one.